thank you for being here. Um, I'm Allison Benders, the Vice President for Mission and Ministry. So thank you to all who are here, and thank you to our live stream group. Um, so this is a really important topic, and we're so glad that David Fitzgerald is here to break this open for us. Um, as we begin, though, let's um, pause, and let's take a moment to acknowledge the sacred land where campus is located. We acknowledge that Santa Clara University sits on the land of the Ohlone and Mwekma Ohlone people who trace their ancestry through the missions Dolores, Santa Clara, and San Jose. We remember their connection to this region and we give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. So let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people of the past and the present. Thank you, thank you. So um, I wanna just say again, thank you for being here, David, and how important the question of asylum is. Um, the, I happen to do a very little research because I'm hoping to learn today, but um, approximately three or 4% of the population in the world according to the UN, is in, um, is in migration or refugee due status due to wars, violence, uh, seeking a better life. And we hear about these stories in the news. And the question for us at Santa Clara, of course, for our mission to build a more just, humane, and sustainable world is what's an informed response? How do we um, understand the world around us? How can we respond? And how does this shape the work that we do? Um, the other thing that you should know about is that the International Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities has identified migration, refugee, and asylum issues as one of their top three or four priorities for this next five years, of course, will go on in addition to environmental um, concerns, environmental justice, and um, other social issues, right? So migration, asylum, and refugee issues is critical to the work that we do as Jesuit universities and, um, and for all of us, people of goodwill. So um, with that, I would say welcome to you, David, and Aaron's gonna introduce you. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Allison. Um, Enrique Pumar, who is the, really the co-organizer and the kind of inspiration behind this lecture series, isn't able to be here today. Um, so I'm stepping in to introduce Dave, but I know Enrique is watching on the live stream, and I know he wanted to be here, um, but I just want to give him some recognition for the work he's done to make this happen, and we'll continue to um, do lecture series like this through Enrique's um, insight and collaboration. So I'd like to welcome you all to the second annual Global Migration and Refugee Studies Distinguished Lecture. Um, and this lecture ser series is dedicated to discern migration trends in a global context from a humanistic perspective. And to help us understand how nations regulate asylum seekers, um, it engage with the question of asylum and refugees, especially rich democracies, we invited Professor David Fitzgerald here to be with us. Professor Fitzgerald holds a uh, Gilder Chair in US-Mexican Relations and Coder Rex, the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he's a prolific scholar of migration who has won multiple meritorious awards for his published work. Among them are the ASA Distinguished Scholarly Book Award from 2016, the APSA Migration Citizen Section Best Book Award in 2015, uh, the Political Science, the Political Sociology Best Award Book Award in 2015, uh, and an honorable mention for the Theodore uh, Saludas Book Prize on Immigration and Ethnic History as well. Um, and so today, Professor Gerald will discuss how the world's rich democracies regulate the flow of asylum seekers. Um, and I hope you join us in the reception afterwards when we ride upstairs. Of course, if you're on the live stream, that won't be possible, but we look forward to continuing the conversation after the event. Um, we'll also have time for questions and answers. So welcome to Professor David Fitzgerald. Well, thanks very much for, for joining us this afternoon to talk about what I think we'll all agree is you know, one of the, the critical issues that we face most in this country and, and around the world. Um, I'm coming to you from, from San Diego, and if you go to San Diego, and if you cross the border into uh, Tijuana, this photograph here on the screen is taken from the, the Mexican side looking north into the US. 
Uh, border enforcement seems really obvious. And usually the way that we read about border enforcement in the news is about these spectacles, these, these really concrete manifestations of the border. In fact, every time I fly east of San Diego um, at night, I can see the borderline down beneath me. There's a set of fortifications um, and these bright stadium style lights that have been put there since the, the mid 1990s that make that line visible even from 35,000 feet. But what I want to propose to you is that these, these obvious border spectacles, these kind of concrete manifestations of the border, while important, are much less important than a whole set of other kinds of measures that often are conducted in secret or in the darkness at sea, but always far away from a country's borders. And it's those kinds of what the late migration scholar Aristide Zolberg called remote control efforts, almost like the remote control that I'm holding in my hand, that those efforts are much more important actually at deterring uh, migration and controlling flows than these more concrete manifestations that we see about um, on TV. So a number of different scholars from different disciplines, whether from the law or political geography or sociology, anthropology, political science, have all come up with some similar kinds of terms for thinking about the externalization of border control, or as I said, the remote control of, of, of these functions. And I think it's important to understand these for a number of different reasons. If we think about why, why do we care? Why should we spend the next 90 minutes talking about this? Um, one of them is to answer a common question, which I think is a fair question, which is why don't asylum seekers uh, simply get into line to come uh, legally to a country like the US or Canada and Europe? Why, why, why do we see images on TV of people who don't have papers and they're you know, potentially crossing the desert without papers, uh, crossing dangerous jungle areas like the Darien Gap? I think it's a fair question and there's a, there's a good answer for it. Um, and I, understanding remote control techniques helps us understand that there are in fact very few legal ways for asylum seekers to come. That in order to seek asylum, you have to be at the border of a country or you have to be already inside the country and the governments of rich countries like the U.S. put all kinds of systematic barriers in place uh, to keep most asylum seekers or potential asylum seekers from ever reaching a border where they can ask for asylum in the first place. I'll talk more about that, but that's the first thing that I think is at stake. The second is that a lot of researchers and governments and other advocates and geo people are interested in figuring out to what extent are governments able to control migration or manage the numbers or types of people who, who move across borders. And it's really important to understand remote control in answering this question because, again, most of the, the control effect happens from deterring people from even leaving or ever getting anywhere close to their intended destination. So it's not simply enough to go down to the border between Tijuana and San Diego and seeing what percentage of the people trying to cross are getting across. Most of that control is happening very far away. And then from a, from a legal perspective and a, and a normative perspective, it's important to understand how organizations like the government, uh, how, how, how states will sometimes explicitly accept certain kinds of laws, certain kinds of treaties that they have signed, but then systematically try to evade the spirit of those laws. And so they'll very narrowly comply with those laws and there's a debate about whether or not they're actually complying, but credibly they can say we're, we're complying with the law, but again, trying to undermine the whole spirit of humanitarianism, uh, the whole spirit of human rights that, underlaws, uh, that, that underlies uh, laws of, uh, of asylum in the first place. Okay, so the, the basic uh, principle here that um, is being um, undermined in many ways is the notion of non refoulement so this is a French term that's been brought into English and doesn't have another English equivalent. And the, you know, the non-legal sort of everyday definition of non-refoulement would be that we don't send people back into the arms of their persecutors. There's, there's a more specific definition in the UN Refugee Convention. Um, and basically the, the idea here is that protection is provided in the sense that uh, government will not return someone who is a refugee um, and who is refugee based on five particular, one of five particular grounds, that they're fearing persecution 
for reason of their race, their nationality, their religion, their political opinion, or their membership in a particular social group. So altogether, this constitutes the, the basic notion of, of non refoulement And not every country in the world is, uh, is a party to this convention, but most of them are, including the US and all of the, 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 the rich democracies. Um, it's in the Refugee Convention and it's, it's 1967 protocol. So there are more or less 190 or so states in the world and 148 of them are party to the Refugee Convention. There's another version of non refoulement in the Convention Against Torture which is that people will not be returned to a country where they will face torture. And there's a fairly expansive definition of what torture means. And it doesn't matter why they will be tortured. It doesn't have to be because of their political opinion or their religion or so forth. Um, and so there are even more countries that have signed on to that uh, 1984 Convention Against Torture. There are 170 states that have agreed not to do that. So this is a pretty strong principle in international law. It's been incorporated into the laws of a lot of countries, including the US. Uh, we see this right now in, in our 1980 Refugee Act. OK, so what do governments do then? What do states do to avoid activating this norm of non refoulement Well, they, they play with territoriality. They, they play with notions of, um, of where rights begin and people's access to particular territories. So the first way they do that is by pushing border control out, away from their territory, into the territory of other states, into international waters. Um, and that can be done at an extreme distance. The most extreme distance that I've personally experienced is when flying, say, from Abu Dhabi, which is on the United Arab Emirates, to the US. You pass US Border Patrol or US uh, Department of Homeland Security inspection um, and customs inspection in Abu Dhabi, which is 13,500 kilometers from, from LAX. So these are, these are US officers in a foreign country, very far away, and you have to meet all of those requirements of US law. You're interacting with these US agents on another country's soil. So it's, it's one of many manifestations that I'm going to talk about uh, of this kind of really long range uh, border enforcement. But at the same time as you have these kind of dynamics happening over the, the space of thousands of kilometers, you have these micro distinctions that are made down to the meter, even the centimeter in some cases, to decide where the particular groups of people's rights begin. Um, the easiest way to see that is to go down again to the US-Mexico border. And you'll see all of these, uh, depending on where you are on the border, if it's a bridge or a land crossing, you'll see some form of marker where there is a particular line about that thick that measures what's Mexico and what's the US. And if you cross this border often, you might not really think about that. But that distinction is extremely important. And beginning uh, in, the, in the Trump administration, uh, US agents or private uh, security guards hired by the US government would actually put their boots right up against that border line and here in the photograph, you can see this, this is a slightly different version of the line, but this metal strip here, this is the line between on the right, that's Mexico, on the left, that's the United States. And so they would put their boots right up against the line, and they would check people trying to cross to make sure that they either had a, a U.S. passport or that they had a visa to enter the U.S. Now, this is not the full documentary check that takes place, in this case, about another 100 meters inside the U.S., this is simply to make sure that someone would not be able to step over that line and be able to ask for asylum because they were never actually considered to be in the US. So this is what I mean about these really micro distinctions in space, making a giant difference in the kinds of rights that, that people have. So there have been many different versions of these kinds of technologies of remote control. Uh, most of them are not new. Most of them, uh, began in the 1930s and 1940s to bottle up Jews fleeing fascism in Europe, trying to reach places of sanctuary in the liberal Western democracies and Palestine and throughout Latin America and so forth. So almost every single major technique of remote control that we can identify today, we can find precursors of in the 1930s and 40s. And I don't have time now in the period of this presentation to go through all of these. But uh, suffice it to say that on this list of techniques, 
you'll, if, if you follow the news, you'll, you'll recognize uh, these techniques. These are the same techniques that are around now in the q and I'm happy to talk about, um, about specific historical examples. So we have historians in the, in the room. I've revealed myself to be a frustrated historian, even though I'm a sociologist. And you know, historians are often killjoys when sociologists claim that something is new. Um, and they'll always find a precedent. But sometimes something is new under the sun. So, so what is new? Um, so what's new is that now we have a whole system of global um, externalization of borders. It's not uh, kind of an ad hoc system targeting one particular ethnic group. It's a system that affects the entire globe and that affects many, many different uh, nationalities. So it's a system in several different ways. And what I try to, to do in this book is to show how all of these different systems, well, or how, how the system, I, I should say, is composed of all of these different components and to put all of the components together because it's only when you see all of the components together that you realize just how difficult it would be for someone to travel legally, for example, to, uh, to come to a border and ask for asylum. And so I use this metaphor of uh, medieval castle building uh, and talk about an architecture of repulsion aimed at keeping unwanted asylum seekers out. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean over the course of most of the presentation by these metaphors, but one is a, is a cage to try to cage people up, usually metaphorically, but sometimes literal cages, um, in, in their countries of origin or in uh, remote regions, uh, a dome, kind of aerial dome over the airspace to control air passengers coming in, moats to control people who were crossing by sea, uh, buffers using other states uh, as, as buffer um, territories and as governments to do the, the dirty work, if you will, of, of migration control in their territories and also uh, Barbicans, these kind of, I'll explain what I mean by that later if you're not familiar with Barbicans, but the conceptual bottom line is these are spaces right at the edge of a border where more restrictive rules are put into place. And it's a system in the sense that you have like this, this castle, as I said, but it's also a system because you have a global sharing of ideas about how to conduct these kinds of controls uh, actual flows of money, flows of equipment, um, flows of information about particular individuals and where they have crossed, which borders they have crossed, who they are, um, training officials in different countries. So that there's truly a global circulation of, of material and ideational resources around the system of control. Underlying this entire system is... Uh, a set of, of files, many of which we have come to take for granted, um, but which have been historically elaborated like, like everything else. So let's, let's get into the meat now of some particular forms of remote control. So the first is the visa. Uh, you might think that's normal that you have to get a visa before you travel. That's a pretty recent idea in human history. That whole system of getting a visa before you travel to a country um, started and any kind of large scale in World War I. It was introduced as a temporary wartime measure. And like a lot of temporary wartime measures, World War I ended a long time ago, and we still have that system. So a lot of these systems were brought in at a particular moment, but then they accreted over time. They're very sticky. Once they're in place, it's very hard to roll them back. Regardless of the political stripes of who's in power, it's not that these policies are never rolled back, but it's very, very difficult. And the visa is example number one. Okay, so why does that matter for asylum? The, the visas are, are not um, as easily available for some nationalities as others. And we can systematically look at which nationalities have, quote unquote, stronger passports. That is, nationalities where you don't have to have a visa in advance, or you could, you could simply get a visa at the, at the border. If you, if you were to show up at that border. And so the, uh, the good folks at Hindley, uh, which is an uh, international legal concern, have created this annual ranking of, uh, of passports. And so the world's most powerful passports are the passports of um, you know, Japan, South Korea, a bunch of countries in Western Europe. The US is not very far behind, the UAE. And with these kind of passports, you can have access to, you know, depending on the exact nationality, you know, 170 countries, 160 countries, something in that range that you can access visa-free 
I'm showing you here the bottom of the list. These are the most restricted nationalities, um, where if you have an Afghan passport, you can access only 27 countries as opposed to, say, 170 uh, without a visa. And the, the most restricted countries, the, the so-called weakest passports, are also uh, the passports of nationalities with high rates of asylum seeking. And many countries have been quite explicit in using their visa policy to keep out asylum seekers in particular, not just migrants from that place, but asylum seekers in particular. Um, okay, and some, something else that's um, that this part of the system is these biometric databases. So this doesn't start with you know fancy new technologies of iris scans and so forth. This starts with things like photographs and uh, fingerprints, which the global spread of those technologies was very much about migration control and controlling particular groups of people like anarchists more than 100 years ago. Now they've become more sophisticated, um, but this is one of the reasons why we can talk about a, a global system now is that that kind of information is very quickly shared um, across different government agencies now in a way that used to be much more difficult. The, the records of, of entry and exit are also often shared. So when you're traveling, and you hand over your passport and you see the agent typing in the keyboard, you know, the, the curious bear will wonder what, what that agent is seeing. Usually the facility is designed such that it's difficult to see that. But every, every now and then you can kind of get a glimpse. And, and, and sometimes you see that there's a huge amount of information about where you've just traveled that's available to that agent, um, even if you're talking about uh, third, third countries that you've passed through. Okay, another basic... Um, technique of control in this system is, is caging people up. And by that, I'm going to talk about, again, a metaphor of, of containing them and then some specific places where we can talk about cages with actual bars. So one of the most important ways that, that people are, are contained is in refugee camps. Some refugee camps are closed. Uh, some are open. By closed, I mean people, once they're in the camp, cannot come and go. Um, others are open where people can, can leave and work and there's, there's a lot of variation around camps. Uh, the issue of camps is important because here you see that the, the architecture of international protection is very closely related to the architecture of propulsion. The same camp where all kinds of very important things are happening, where people are getting life-saving protection, where they're getting food, where they're getting maybe, if it's a long-established camp, education, healthcare, et cetera, where all of those, what most people would consider to be positive things are going on, are also containing um, potential asylum seekers there so that they will not continue on to richer democracy. Because 85% of the world's refugees are in poor and middle-income countries. So it's only a, a small fraction that end up uh, in, in the US or Canada or Australia or places like that. Now, who pays for these camps? Often these camps are in, in poor countries, uh, a country like Chad, for example. And overwhelmingly, the budget of the UNHCR, that's the UN Refugee Agency, comes from the rich countries of the global north. So there's a, what some people have called a global compact where uh, the rich democracies pay poorer countries to contain refugees and keep them there and, and just take a few symbolic resettlements to those rich democracies. These days, even pandemic issues aside, you know, half of 1% of the world's refugees are resettled. So it's, it's really a, a drop in the it's important for individual families, of course, but at a, at a population level, that's really a, a drop in the bucket. The vast majority of the world's refugees are in a, a country that neighbors a conflict country. And it's more than simply the fact that this, this money is coming from the rich uh, democracies. Most of the money is earmarked to be used in particular um, operational areas where the UN Refugee Agency is. So this allows um, governments in the global north to have kind of an extraordinary impact on where their money is used and to target groups of people that they don't want arriving at their own borders. Uh, it has some other pernicious effects in, in, in budgeting as well. But the bottom line is that the, the rich democracies are paying other countries via the UNHCR to, to do that work. Okay, another way that people are, are caged up is to cage them in their countries of origin through military intervention. There have been a number of important military interventions or threatened military interventions that have, at least as one of their stated goals, exactly that. So in 1994, the, the U.S. government was evidently prepared to 
to invade Haiti and, and occupy it. In the end, there was not an invasion, but there was an occupation. But there are, there are other examples we can think of. The uh, no-fly zone in, uh, in northern Iraq, uh, the intervention in Libya, other interventions in, in the Balkans, for example, which often had at least as one of their specific goals, preventing refugees from leaving those conflict areas and arriving in Europe, for example. So that's, that's a very direct way, especially when we're talking about an island like Haiti. Um, that's a way of keeping people not just coming to the U.S., but leaving to go anywhere, um, you know, another island or, or someplace in, in Latin America. The Australian government, since 2001, um, developed this in a, in a particularly unique way in their so-called uh, offshore processing of asylum seekers. What makes the Australian plan unusual, and th this is... There's a lot of detail here that we could unpack, but I'll give you the overview here. Uh, what makes this unusual is that th this was a way of taking asylum seekers who were trying to reach Australia from Indonesia. They weren't from Indonesia. They were simply passing through Indonesia, um, intercepting them at sea, and then taking them to territories where they had never passed through, specifically Manus Island, which is part of Papua New Guinea, and the island of Nauru. Nauru is the world's smallest island republic. It's about the size of Dulles Airport outside of Washington, D.C. And to this day, there are um, asylum seekers. Many of them have gone through refugee status determination and been found to legally meet the definition of a refugee. So any, any, anyone who has looked at those cases would agree they are refugees. And they're still, after many years, being held on this tiny little, um, this tiny little island. So th this is a, an idea, this idea of offshore processing that has been copied. So Denmark has an agreement to do this with Rwanda. Britain has an agreement to do this with Rwanda. What makes this unique, again, is that it's, it's a way to take people and put them into a territory for processing, even though they never went through that territory. And why Nauru? It's because it's an extremely small place, tiny population, economically totally dependent on Australia, um, and a way for the Australian government to offload that what they would describe as, as a burden. Now, one of the things that the Australian government does that is also done by the EU, by the US, to a lesser extent by Canada, is to try to dissuade people from ever uh, trying to arrive to ask for asylum using all different kinds of publicity campaigns. On the screen here, you can see a graphic novel, sort of a comic book that was distributed in Afghanistan, um, by the, paid for by the Australian government, and there are many, many pages. I'm just showing you a little snippet here, but it tells the story of this man who's evidently, uh, you know, typically from the persecuted Hazara minority who is uh, attempting to reach Australia. Instead, he's intercepted. He's taken to this godforsaken island held in a, in a pen um, with this uh, chain link fence, and, and he regrets at the end of the graphic novel that he ever tried. He, he misses his family. He wishes that he had just stayed back home in Afghanistan. Uh, so there, there are similar um, kinds of uh, campaigns that you can find in Central America, for example, paid for by the, by the US government to discourage people from leaving. There's no evidence that those are effective, but they're, they're common regardless. Then something else that is, is done, and this is especially common in the European context, is a safe country of origin designation. It's a, a legal designation that there's a rebuttable presumption that if someone is coming from a particular country, that that's their country of origin, that they're not a refugee because that's a country that uh, observes human rights protections, for example. And if you look into the politics of how these designations are made, it's not simply looking at the world's countries and deciding where human rights are most upheld. Um, you know, there, there are many other factors that go into that. But. Okay, moving along to the idea of an aerial dome to... Uh, prevent asylum seekers from arriving by, by air. The, the major technique of, of control of passengers is to get airlines to do the work of migration control. Most migration control is not done by government agents. It's done by the clerk from um, Turkish Airlines at the airport in Istanbul or from Lufthansa in Munich. It's, it's, it's done by private individuals who are working for transportation companies, and they are checking to make sure that the passenger that is going to 
uh, board the ship or the, uh, the aircraft is going to be admissible on the other end. So why do these, uh, mostly now these days, airlines, why do they do that? It's because if they allow inadmissible passengers on board who are then denied entry when they get to the other side, say when they arrive at JFK or LAX, SFO, um, then the airline has to pay a fine. Um, and depending on the country, the airline has to pay for the cost of um, keeping that person um, in detention uh, until they're deported. And also the airline has to eat the cost of transporting that person back to the point of, of embarkation. So what does that mean? Is that the airlines are heavily incentivized not to let someone on the aircraft who doesn't already have a visa or who doesn't need a visa. Um, they're not going to let on the aircraft someone who says, oh, I'm going to ask for asylum because I'm being persecuted uh, as soon as I get to my destination. Um, and these sanctions have been around a very long time. They all started out as sanctions on shipping companies and then in the 1950s and well, 40s, 50s, and then in various other ways since were just transported onto the airline system. All of the countries that I'm talking about in this particular book, which is the EU and its member states, Canada, the US, Australia, also have carrier liaison agents. So these are, are government agents that operate in foreign airports. They don't have any legal authority, but they give advice to the airlines about questionable passengers, whether or not to let them onto the aircraft. And so it's a way to avoid taking any kind of legal responsibility for the action because they're simply giving advice, they would say, um, while still making sure that people who might be asking for asylum have a very difficult time getting onto the aircrafts in the first place. And there, there are hundreds of such officers at major airports around the world. Um, periodically, this kind of thing shows up in the news. It's politically sensitive in Mexico, for example, but um, the, the agents are operating kind of behind the scenes in, in the major airports around the world doing this. The US, um, at this point, uniquely has a preclearance program. And has anyone ever been part of preclearance? I mentioned the one in Abu Dhabi, but Anyone who's flown from Canada to the U.S., for example, has experienced this. There are 15 airports in six countries um, where passengers have to pre-clear before they get on the plane. And when the plane arrives in the U.S., it's as if it were a domestic flight. Just people simply walk off the plane and collect their bags and go. Um, there are 600 U.S. agents in these uh, 15 airports around the world conducting this kind of pre-clearance. So why is this an important for an asylum story? Well, if you've passed through those preclearance areas and paid attention, you'll see, for example, in, in Canada, they'll have on the wall the particular um, language from the, the US federal code that gives them authority to do various things in those spaces. So they're activating US law in some ways. Uh, the Department of Justice of the US has um, prosecuted people for smuggling bringing undeclared goods through those spaces, but you can't ask for asylum in those spaces. So the government turns on and off its ideas about whether or not the U.S. has jurisdiction, depending on the kind of, of law that we're talking about. And that's about 16% uh, of arriving U.S. passengers um, on international flights have already been pre-cleared. So and, and I suspect that that will grow in the future. That's been around since 1952. Um, but it's, it's, it's becoming more important. Okay, moving now to the question of, of moats. And in some ways you might think, well, this is obvious that uh, waterways are, are places where the government um, controls people who are trying to cross. But it's especially in this area around, uh, around the control of uh, waterways that you see the government playing with the rules about what constitutes uh, the United States for purpose, or what constitutes Australia for the purpose of um, immigration law. Uh, on the screen here, you can see a patch, like a you know, shoulder patch of a multi-agency uh, task force that is planning for uh, large-scale movements out of the Caribbean to Florida. Think of the 1980 Mario boat lift, a scenario like that. Um, so you can see the Talons of Eagle here coming down over uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic and, and Cuba. The contemporary program that the U.S. has to intercept, and specifically the Coast Guard has to intercept migrants, which would include people who are going to be seeking asylum, um, dates back to the Reagan administration. 
um, which was targeting asylum, uh, sorry, uh, Haitian asylum seekers who were crossing from, from Haiti to, to Florida. And over the years, many different nationalities have been uh, caught up in this, but very much dominated by two nationalities, Haitians and, and Cubans. So on the, the screen here, that's Cubans and uh, yellow and, and Haitian nationals in, in light blue. And you, you'll see two big spikes there in the, in the, um, the early and mid 1990s of, of large scale outflows. And when those, when those spikes reached a certain level, the government changed its rules around um, when asylum law applies. So in the, um, in, in the original formulation under the Reagan administration of, uh, of interception at sea, it was very explicitly in the executive order that when the U.S. Coast Guard would intercept people in international waters away from U.S. territory, that they would apply um, all the provisions of the U.S. Uh, Refugee Act, the 1980 Refugee Act, that the U.S. would not refoul people from international waters. Well, after there was a, a large-scale spike in the number of people uh, being intercepted, um, President uh, Bush, Bush 1, uh, changed those rules and said that the U.S. no longer considered itself to be obliged under the Refugee Act or under um, having signed the, the protocol to the Refugee Convention to, um, to be bound by this principle of non-refoulement if the people were intercepted outside of the territory of the U.S. And there was a, a famous case that was litigated, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided on behalf of the administration. And the Supreme Court, if you look at that hearing, said we recognize very explicitly that this is an effort by the government to keep out people who, if they were allowed to arrive, would often be found to be refugees. We recognize that that's what the government is doing, but this is in the authority of the government. That, that was a 5-4 decision. Um, any law professor I've ever talked to thinks that that's bad law, but that continues to be the law in the U.S. Um, in practice, the government did something that has been colloquially called, this is certainly not formal, but colloquially called the shout test. In the image here, you can see, this is from the mid-1990s, of, of a Coast Guard cutter that has intercepted a group of Haitian nationals. They're on the deck of the cutter. And if somebody were to jump up and down and say, stop, stop, don't, don't send me back. If you send me back, I'll be killed because of my membership in a particular social group. Then there would be a kind of a rudimentary screening process. Coast Guard personnel were instructed not to interact with people on board that had been rescued unless they had to for the purpose of you know, basic health checks or providing food or things. And, uh, and I've talked to people who are in the Coast Guard at the time who confirms that this is true. Deliberately trying to kind of avoid, kind of, you know, hear no evil, see no evil uh, scenario. And it, it's sort of a, a small crystallization of a broader um, effort to, to hear no evil, to see no evil by, by keeping people away from a border away from the TV cameras where their, their plight may be made known. Um, there are a couple of nationals that were treated uh, differently in a systematic you know, policy um, specific way, in a written policy kind of way. Uh, there was an exception for nationals of the People's Republic of China who were asked uh, four questions about why did they leave, what would happen if they were sent back. And until 2017, um, a separate policy for, for Cubans. Now, it's especially in policies around Cuban nationals that you can see the way that the government is playing with these rules of, of jurisdiction and often Kafkaesque kinds of ways. So you, you may have heard of the wet foot, dry foot policy. There's no formal law called the wet foot, dry foot law. This, this is just a common name that's used to refer to a constellation of statutes, court rulings, uh, regulations, uh, informal practices. What this meant is that the, the wet foot part of it meant that beginning in 1994, when there was an agreement between the Cuban government and the U.S. government, that um, Cubans who were intercepted in um, international or U.S. territorial waters would be sent back to Cuba, and the Cuban government agreed to take them back. This was a big breakthrough moment in those negotiations. Unless, and this is important, that unless the Cubans, the individual Cubans, had passed a screening on board that 
showed that they had a credible fear of being persecuted if they were returned. So also much more rudimentary screening than you would get in a formal court hearing, but some kind of screening that was applied, in this case, to every individual. So that was the wet foot part of the policy. The dry foot, which was until the last few days of the Obama administration, that, um, that Cuban nationals who reached US dry land would, under normal situations, be paroled into the US. This was a mechanism used to parole about um, 1 million Cuban nationals into the US from the revolution until, until now. Um, but curiously, the, the language there was not around reaching US territory, it was around dry land, which is an idea that's otherwise not in, in the law. So that led to all kinds of sort of absurd but high consequence situations where there were discussions of what constitutes US dry land. Just to give you one example from 2016, there was a group of, uh, I think 21, 22 or so, Cubans who was trying to reach Florida. They reached US territorial waters. They reached this lighthouse. This lighthouse, no one disputes, is the property of the federal government in US territorial waters. There's about this much water um, at, uh, at low tide between the bottom of the lighthouse and the reef. And, and they climbed up the ladder in the lighthouse and they said, okay, we're on US dry land, we're safe. We'd like to ask, you know, we, we would like protection, don't send us back to Cuba. And so the, the federal government said, no, we're going to send you back. This does not count as dry land. So this was all litigated in court. And eventually um, the Cubans lost their case because the courts ruled that you would have to swim to get from here to the beach. Therefore, this didn't count. There were some similar cases around people who reached pieces of bridge that had become the unused bridge that were disembodied from the rest of the, of the road system linking the, the bridge to the land. Um, now, some of the folks who, who reached this, this lighthouse, though, were able to pass a credible fear uh, screening, but the government of the U.S. wanted to disincentivize people from taking this route. So it said, okay, well, we will not do value to Cuba but we don't want you to come to Florida. And so they were eventually sent to Australia and returned for the US, taking some asylum seekers who'd been found to be refugees, who'd been held on Nauru. And so there was this global circulation of people to deliberately make it hard on them and to uh, discourage other people from taking a similar route, but to maintain this, this principle of non refoulement Okay, so in the European Union, um, the, the situation in some ways is similar, in some ways it's quite different. Um, in, the, uh, in the 2010s, the Italian government, with support from, from Frontex, which is the European border guard agency, um, began intercepting people at sea in the Mediterranean, trying to reach Italy and ask for asylum, and pushing them back, meaning taking them forcibly back to Libya and, and forcibly taking them off the, off the boats and pushing them back into the docks in Libya. So they, they started doing this. There was a lawsuit, um, which was won by the group of asylum seekers and the Hersey Gemma, that was one of the Somalia asylum seekers. Um, I'll go back to this. The European Court of Human Rights, uh, which has jurisdiction in the area, said, yes, even though that was in international waters, Effectively, the Italian government had control over those people. It had some kind of personal sovereignty over them at that moment by controlling their motion. So they were, they, they were responsible for them and could not simply take them back to a place where they would be persecuted. So that, that was the ruling of the European Court of Human Rights. Okay, so what did the Italian government do? And then it turns out later also the Maltese government has done this, is to pay off the, the Libyan Coast Guard, but also these militias in Libya Recall that Libya is in a state of civil war. In fact, the very same organizations that had been responsible for smuggling people to Europe were now being paid to detain them um, in these really horrific conditions. Um, even on CNN, you can see video of actual slave markets in the most extreme cases, people being bought and sold for their work. Um, really horrific abuses in, in Libya, um, all paid for by, by European countries. And so... That's one of the ways that this corridor has been mostly shut down, but periodically people try to go. Um, they, they get past the, uh, the Libyan Coast Guard and militias trying to keep them from reaching um, Italy. And uh, you, you may have heard in the news recently that there was a, a ship that sank right off of um, Calabria with a large loss of life. Well, all of these techniques of, of, of trying to get, 
pay off other governments to, to do that work. They, they, only, they only work if you can find uh, other governments willing to, to play the game. And other governments don't always play the game. The Australian government approached many different countries before they found uh, Nauru willing to do this. The U.S. Uh, approached many different countries in the Caribbean trying to house um, Haitian asylum seekers. Most of them refused, which is why they were, they were kept in, in Guantanamo. There are some other techniques, and one of them is uh, shipwriter agreements, where a, a powerful country like, say, the U.S. or a European Union country um, will have a vessel operating in a foreign countries' waters, in their territorial waters, but those, th th those other weaker countries will um, put a single official on board who will give legal authority for the more powerful country's navy to do migration control. So for example, the Spanish Navy is sometimes operating in the Senegalese territorial waters with an official from the Senegalese military on board in order to intercept people in Senegalese waters and send them back to the beach. Um, the US has similar agreements around the Caribbean. One of the newer technologies is to use drones. So the, the, uh, the European governments, in particular Italy, have been very active in this regard. Frontex is very active in this regard. This is important from a legal perspective because the, there's a strong norm, probably the strongest norm in the law of the sea, is that if uh, mariners are in distress, other mariners have uh, a, le a strong legal obligation, a strong, not just moral, but legal obligation to render assistance, as long as rendering assistance won't put them in, in danger as well. So one of the ways to get around that norm is to surveil using drones because if the drone sees that there's a small boat that's sinking, the drone can't do anything about saving those people, whereas um, uh, you know, mariners on ships are supposed to. Uh, there, there's, there's a long, very um, disturbing history of the effect of control measures in the Mediterranean of undermining that norm of, of rescue. Um, many ships will now uh, turn off their transponders when there's a rescue call that goes out. They don't want to be identified. They don't want to be asked to go um, save people who are drowning. Um, Fishermen who've rescued um, migrants at sea have been prosecuted and have their boats impounded, and so they also are not doing it anymore. And the direct result of that is, is much more loss of life than would otherwise be taking place. In Italy, in Greece, in Hungary, some other countries, there's also been a systematic effort to criminalize the activities of non-governmental organizations that conduct search and rescue operations um, and... You know, what, th this, is, this is not only to prevent those organizations from bringing a particular group of people to, uh, to the beach to ask for asylum, but it's also a way to have fewer watchdogs out there, fewer, fewer you know, independent observers who are, who are bearing testimony to these activities. Okay, let's move now to the idea of buffer states. We read a lot about this in, uh, in the news in, in this country. Certainly, um, the U.S. has used Mexico as a buffer state to control refugees and other migrants for, for a long time, a lot longer than, than we might realize reading the news. And it's usually tried to do that quietly. This is a very sensitive issue in, in Mexico, uh, for reasons that we can understand given the long history of US intervention. Um, but even publicly in 2012, Alan Burson, the Assistant Secretary in the DHS at the Guatemalan border with Chiapas, Chiapas being the southernmost state of Mexico, it's now the southern border of the US in, in practice. So the, these techniques, though, are, are long established, going back at least into the 1980s during the, the civil wars in Central America that sent large numbers of Salvadorans and Guatemalans in particular to uh, the U.S. understand that Santa Clara has a long-standing relationship with um, Jesuit work in, in El Salvador in particular. Um, so some of the things that those that, that, the, that the U.S. has done is to pressure the Mexican government to make it hard for um, nationalities with high rates of asylum seeking to get visas. So going back to the 80s, under U.S. pressure, Mexico made it much more difficult for Central American nationalities to get visas to come to Mexico. Now, it was still possible to come to Mexico, but that meant instead of someone flying to uh, Mexico City and then to Tijuana, then all of a sudden they're, they're on foot or they're taking a taxi or they're on the bus, have a much longer route and also many opportunities for governments to try to detain them and to um, and, and to extort them. Um, and then the, 
going back to the 80s, the U.S. government has also paid for uh, refugee camps in southern Mexico. So the, the UNHCR began operating uh, refugee camps in the state of Chiapas, for example, paid for by the U.S. 35,000 Guatemalans were in those camps and a much smaller number of, of Salvadorans. There were all kinds of restrictions put in place to keep Central Americans from traveling into the north of Mexico. So even if they were allowed to legally stay in the south, their documents explicitly said that they couldn't be in the northern part of the country. And you can see some similar efforts today. Um, the U.S. has a long history of providing training to the, the particular agencies within Mexico have changed over the years. But different agencies involved in border enforcement, whether they're civilian or paramilitary or, or military, the Mexican Navy in particular has been an important part of the story, um, even in the interior of Mexico, uh, providing all kinds of equipment, um, which could mean vehicles, uh, zodiac boats and rivers, but also all kinds of um, computer equipment, scanning equipment, binoculars, all these kinds of things, as well as intelligence about people smuggling operations. And then there are legal tools for, for pressuring the, uh, the government. In addition to visas, the, the U.S. government, has, and as well as the Australian government, and the Europeans have tried to do this too, is to get these buffer states to criminalize um, irregular migration. In many countries, simply entering a uh, the country crossing your border without a visa is not a criminal offense. It's simply an administrative offense. So all, all, of the, all of these rich democracies have pressured buffer states to criminalize. They've usually been successful, but not always. And in fact, Mexico is an outlier here where it's taken away the criminal penalties for um, irregular migration. But the broader pattern is of, is of criminalization. And then also um, using readmission agreements where governments agree to take back um, failed asylum seekers, for example. Something else that you'll have heard about in the news is the idea of safe third country um, designations. The idea that if someone has uh, tried to seek asylum in a country like Canada, but they have passed through a country that's safe, then the, they will be sent back to the country where they are safe. The UN Refugee Convention doesn't specify that anybody who is seeking asylum has to seek asylum in the first safe country they arrive at. but Many countries have tried to, to do this, and then the question legally and morally is, are those countries really safe or not? Um, just because the government says country X is a safe third country, it may or may not be safe for asylum seekers. It may actually be quite, quite dangerous. And in, in Mexico, what's striking is that until very recently, the, the, the southern border, the, uh, the border with Chiapas, uh, the, the border between Chiapas and Guatemala, and the border with um, Belize, looked like an open border. I mean, people would walk back and forth quite, quite freely. Um, it's less so now, but what Mexico has is what they call in Spanish a, a vertical frontier, la frontera vertical, um, of, of transportation checks, whether it's trains or airports or, or roads, um, using racial profiling, basically, and, and shibboleths, the linguistic profiling, to try to d detect people who are not Mexican nationals. Um, so that, that's really the way that that, that control happens. Uh, during the Trump administration, there was a lot of publicity around efforts to um, to make uh, um, Mexico use much harsher measures against um, asylum seekers trying to, to reach the U.S. This is the age of the caravans, you'll recall. Um, th these efforts have gone on for much, much longer than the Trump administration, going back to before 1990, but the best data that we have is available starting in 1990. And in the blue line, you can see deportations of the three primary asylum-seeking nationalities from Central America, Guatemalan, Salvadorans, and Hondurans. Um, those are deportations by the Mexican government. Um, and in red, you see the deportations by the U.S. government. So just making the point that for a long time, uh, the Mexican government has done a lot of that enforcement work, not only on behalf of the U.S., but under quite severe U.S. pressure. All right, the final technique that I'll talk about is, is this idea of Barbicans. And... This, this kind of particular castle metaphor doesn't always work great in the U.S. where we, we don't have so many castles. But in your, in your classic uh, castle construction, you would have a, an armed gatehouse at the, at right outside the main castle proper. And I use this as a metaphor to talk about the way that in, in particular um, border areas, separate rules are made. And, and often there are separate physical structures. And these rules are always more restrictive in different ways. So, you know, access to a translator to be able to ask for asylum in the first place, how long you have, uh, rights to appeal. In many different ways, uh, the rules are harsher. There are different versions of that. 
the version that I call kind of a gulag um, barbican is with uh, Christmas Island, which is uh, a little piece of Australia that's much closer to Indonesia than the rest of Australia, where for a time, um, people who were intercepted to seek asylum were taken to this island in a place where they had far fewer rights than if they had reached the mainland. We can think about Guantanamo in uh, a similar vein. The most aggressive thing that's been done to play with the, these rules at the boundaries of the territory was the, um, the Australian Parliament's excision. This is a, a strange use of excision that I've never seen anywhere else, just for immigration purposes, of excising its own territory to say that that doesn't count for the purpose of, of immigration policy. So what does that mean? So in uh, purple here, we see the, the, these three islands or island groups in the Indian Ocean. And originally, the, the Parliament said, so if you reach those islands, that doesn't count like the rest of Australia um, for asking for asylum. You, you can't ask for asylum if you just reach those areas by, by sea if you come without a visa. Well, then enterprising smugglers got larger boats. They put more cans of fuel in the boats, and they started you know, going around those islands farther and, and landing at these areas up here in the north of the Australian mainland. And so then the, the Parliament of Australia said, well, that area is now also excised. That doesn't count. You can't ask for asylum if you arrive here without a visa. Um, and the smugglers added more cans of fuel and so on and started coming here. And so finally, the government said that all of Australia doesn't. What does that mean? So it is that you cannot ask for asylum in Australia if you arrive by sea without a visa. They, they excise the entire country from itself. There's a different version of this, um, kind of the classical model in Ceuta and Melilla. Ceuta and Melilla, uh, you'll recall, are in some ways the first um, European overseas uh, colonies. Now, the Spanish government would strongly object to that characterization, but these are certainly, we can all agree, these are two little enclaves of one Ceuta and one Melilla, part of Spanish sovereign territory, although Morocco doesn't like it, um, controlled by Spain considered to be under Spanish law in every way. Um, and so what, what's happened over the last uh, 20 years or so is that um, asylum seekers have tried to use this as a gateway into the European Union, and not necessarily to go to Spain as the final destination, but to use this as a transit point to get to places like Germany and Sweden. So, you know, I've, I've been to Ceuta, and, and many of the fortifications are actually modeled on the U.S. fortifications with the border with Mexico. And they become increasingly elaborate. Um, and so, you know, we don't have to get into all the details right now, but there actually is a dry moat paid for by the EU where they dug this big ditch on the Moroccan side um, in the Moroccan patrols. But initially what was happening is that asylum seekers on the Moroccan side, they're not from Morocco, but they were coming from somewhere else through Morocco, and they would climb over this first fence and, uh, and ask for asylum. And the Spanish government almost literally moved the goalposts and said, well, that doesn't count. You, you're, you're not in Spain to be able to ask for asylum if you just crossed the first fence. And there are all these videos of people being you know, beaten by the security guards and then uh, kicked out, often in terrible physical condition through these sally ports in the fence. So then you had um, asylum seekers that were sometimes able to cross all three fences and ask for asylum. And then the government said, no, that doesn't count either because you, you've just entered illegally. You haven't really established your, your legal presence. If you want to ask for asylum, you have to go to the asylum office. And the asylum office is at one gate in the, uh, the border zone, one in each of these enclaves. Well, to get to the asylum office, you have to pass through Moroccan exit control. And the Moroccan government would only allow certain nationalities to pass through to ask for asylum. So if you were from uh, in any African nationality, uh, you wouldn't be allowed to go through in any sub-Saharan African national, they wouldn't be allowed to go through. So it's another way that you see um, a government using a combination of a buffer technique with this kind of uh, barbican technique, all with the goal of making it really difficult for asylum seekers to come in. Then there are countries like, um, like Israel and, and Hungary did this also, where they say it's not just a question of um, crossing the border, you, if you've crossed the border within a certain number of hours or if you've only entered um, the country within a certain number of kilometers, you have restricted rights and you can be um, deported without ever being able to ask for asylum. So this is something the Israeli government did for a while. 
um, along its border with Egypt. The Hungarian government did this along its border with Serbia. Um, so combining time and, uh, and, and distance to create these frontier zones of control. And then a lot of countries, not just France, but France was the site of an important legal case, have policies and international airports. If, if you fly around, I'm sure you've um, experienced this, where there are, are rules in certain parts of the airport. And, and if you were to, to go through a particular door, you would have more rules. If only you could pass through that door. There was a Tom Hanks movie, um, based, The Terminal. I don't know if, has anyone ever seen The Terminal? This was, this was based, and then they changed the facts a lot. That was based on a real case. There, there are a number of cases of people who've lived in airport, specific parts of airports for years. Um, because, uh, well, they, they, um, they have fewer rights to ask for asylum, but the governments of those airports don't want to deport them. So in, um, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, is, is this the Charles de Gaulle or Orly? But in any event, so this, this, this airport is by all accounts in France, right? You look out the window and you're in France, you're in the middle of France, actually. And yet, if you are in the, in the international terminal, you have far fewer rights if you're an asylum seeker than if you're uh, on, on the other side of the door. And there's a little detention center um, right here where you have far fewer rights than if that detention center were just a few uh, meters away. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that we often take for granted, but there's nothing natural about the fact that in the middle of a country, there are these rules that are set up to pretend that someone is not actually in that, in that country. Okay, so just to, to wrap up, is uh, you know governments are not always able to do exactly what they want to do. They're not always able to achieve perfect remote control as if they had one of these devices. There are limits, and beginning with the fact that migrants exercise a lot of agency. They they come up with creative techniques. They often undergo all kinds of deprivations and dangers to be able to circumvent these controls. There's a migration industry that facilitates that. People smugglers, but also. Uh, humanitarian actors that, that facilitate that kind of movement. Um, over time, it becomes much more difficult for governments to control these flows because they become built into the cultural expectations back in communities of origin. Uh, communities can become highly dependent on remittances. There are really developed social networks where people from a particular town or country already have a lot of social contacts in a, in a place where they intend to go. Once you get to that level of connection, it's quite difficult for governments to control these without using the most uh, draconian methods. A uh, point that I made earlier is that governments of potential buffer states often don't want to play that game, or they will keep raising the price um, that, they, that they insist on in terms of trade concessions or visa concessions or simply money to do that work. Um, they, they often won't, won't do that. And then there are, there, are, there are constraints closer to home. There are constraints in uh, impact litigation in the U.S. by actors like the ACLU. Um, the ability of those, uh, the, those legal advocates to, to stop these most draconian policies varies a lot across country. Um, a lot of techniques that might be effective in the U.S. are not at all effective in Australia, for example. So there's a whole story there that we could talk about. Um, but the, the, the final uh, thought that I'll leave you with is that, especially during the pandemic, many governments started much more openly violating this rule of, of non-refoulement and started pushbacks that were much more public. A pushback is, for example, uh, if, if, if somebody is in the water in a small boat of the, uh, of the destination Navy, like the Greek Navy, for example, of simply pushing them back, not, let, not letting them land. We see the use of uh, public health uh, measures like Title 42 um, as, a, as an evident pretext to control asylum seekers much more than any kind of control over public health. So, so this, this norm has been uh, sharply eroded. And what we see increasingly is a combination of uh, these remote control measures that I've just talked about with much more limited um, legal uh, protection given to people who are able to, to step across that line in the sand. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, David, for a wonderful lecture. Now we'll open up the questions from the audience. If anyone has any in particular, I'll, um, we'll need the mic because it's a live stream, so <clears throat> sorry, I'll, I'll hand it to you. Thank you. Okay, hello. I am not from the community of Santa Clara. I came because I found that out the event 
I wanted to say thank you. I read your book while I was living in Hungary. I used to work for a human rights organization in Hungary. It was horrible. And it was, I was really happy to read because I used to work in a human rights organization, so everyone was a lawyer and I am an anthropologist. And I was really happy at that time to read your book because it gave me plain vocabulary to speak out all of this stuff, which is extremely complex. And I haven't read your new book on the sociology of asylum, so I don't know if my, the answer to my question is there, but I will ask it anyway. All of these, and okay, now I work in asylum, but here in the US. So all of these methodologies seem more complex than just allowing people to have access to the territory, then they <laughs> giving them asylum and and you know, giving budget to integration policy, you know, in the end, honestly, all of this seems more complicated. So what do you think about the root causes of externalization and of the exclusion of asylum seekers? Is it racism? Uh, is it, what, what, what are your explanations to that? To that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so what, what are the root causes of, um, of externalization in the first place? So th there are many root causes, and sometimes, this is something I didn't fully appreciate when I wrote this book, but I've been working on it more recently. S sometimes the root causes um, change. And so well, let's talk about um, health, like protection of public health by preventing people coming in with contagious diseases. So that is the root of many of these remote control measures going back to the late 19th, early 20th centuries in places like the US, but also in other places. And that legal infrastructure lies there latent, ready to be activated by a political entrepreneur who takes that and moves it into a different domain. And we see this with the story of Title 42. So, you know, Title 42 was in the public health law in 19, passed in the 1940s, mid 1940s, before the US was part of any kind of international refugee regime. And it gave the U.S. government, and specifically the CDC, the, control, the, the authority to, to limit the entrance of anyone um, in the interest of public health. So there's, there's no reason for me to think that at that time that that law was targeting asylum seekers because they wouldn't have had any rights if they had come as asylum seekers. But even before the pandemic started, and this is not so widely known, this is what journalists have uncovered, even before the pandemic started, Stephen Miller, the architect of President Trump's um, immigration policies, was aware of that provision, which was quite obscure, and wanted to use that as a way to prevent all kinds of people from coming in for reasons that had nothing to do with public health. And we can see from the way that that uh, was enacted that that wasn't simply meant to keep out people who might be carrying COVID, be more likely to carry COVID for the, a number of different reasons we could talk about if anyone disputes that, to think that that was not really a public health use of that measure. So. You take something that was a public health measure, and then for, I think, knowing the work of Stephen Miller for straightforward racist reasons, um, it's used as a, as a control measure. Um, so, you know, the, the issue of securitization, that's also something that's not new. Um, you know, the, the, there are all kinds of um, measures were put in place to keep out asylum, refugees just generally. Um, that were justified by, by security rationales going back 100 years. As long as there has been a notion of refugees, um, security has been one of the, uh, this sometimes a real interest, but more often than not, a, a pretext. Uh, so I think, I think race is, is part of it. I don't, think it's, I don't think it can be reduced to race, but, but certainly we see, for example, and um, I mean, there's actually polling on this in Europe. There, there are a number of countries where large percentages of the population, a third of the population, 40% of the population, say that they don't want refugees um, unless they're Christian. Uh, and in Poland, for example, prior to the Ukrainian, uh, uh, the, the flight of Ukrainians from the, the current Russian invasion, um, that, that was a preference. So, so certainly preferences around uh, race and, and language, uh, religion, are, are obviously part of the rationale in many different contexts. Thank you. I'll be very brief, I hope. 
the revelations in Mark Pompeo's book about the secret negotiations with the current foreign minister of Mexico about agreements that were totally behind the scenes and not made public until the book, really. I think reinforce your point about you know this behind the scenes negotiations going on at all levels. You know? I guess the best way I have to shortly phrase my question is when will governments accept that the tide cannot be stopped? What is it going to take to acknowledge the changes due to climate, the changes due to economic conditions, and other factors that are among the main costs for migration in general? And and political reasons usually for asylum. What will it take in your experience or in your uh, hypothesizing to allow governments to say, we've had this all wrong. We really have to change this policy. You know, the US for a long time had an open borders policy and that's why it became a nation of immigrants, right? So things like race, religion and other factors started intervening, but what do you think might be the the factors that may cause the rich democracies to eventually adjust the perspective and recognize the benefits of freer migration flows? Yeah, great, great tough question. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons why we see these kinds of restrictions in a way that we didn't see in the age of open immigration, when, for example, in 1835, my great-grandfather came as an illiterate 18-year-old laborer he walked off the boat in New York. His name was on the manifest, but otherwise there was no migration control. So what, what would we go back to that situation? What would it take to go back to that situation? As long as we have nation states, I think that's highly unlikely because the whole idea of nation states is that states represent a particular group of people. The nation, there is an obligation there are, uh, to, to provide different kinds of social welfare in ways that were only incipient. Uh, in that age of open migration. So I think it's hard to imagine going back to that anytime in the next, I don't know, 1,500 years. Um, it's interesting to think about, but I think it's, it's highly unlikely. Um, and I think it's, governments hate flows that look like they're uncontrolled. And they especially hate, and I don't have a great rationale for, uh, explanation of this, they especially hate arrivals by sea. That A handful of people arriving by sea excites all kinds of, political smoke and in a way that the same number of people arriving in the airport or even walking across the land don't. There's something about sea arrivals that is, I think this helps explain what people get so excited in, in the UK. And even in Canada, when the Canadian government has had these really harsh crackdowns, it's been around you know three or four boats that, that come. So I think the governments always want to have control, but we know that they have enormous capacity and these rich markets have enormous capacity to bring people in to process tens of thousands of people a year without a lot of hullabaloo. We, we've seen this with, uh, you know, in the end of the Obama administration, we had up to 50,000 Cubans a year crossing the Mexican border, being very quietly processed. Um, and unless you followed the news very carefully or you had family involved or something, you didn't even know about it. Um, similar numbers of Central American miners, you know, became the headline TV news every day. So avoiding the, 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 some kind of spectacle, I think, is inherent now to what governments are, are trying to accomplish. Um, but as we see the unfavorable dependency ratios of not enough young workers uh, for, for older pensioners, which is less of a problem in the U.S. than it is in the rest of the world, but in the, there's not a single country in Europe where uh, replacement, where, where fertility levels are at replacement, right? So the, the populations, unless there's immigration, will start to decline. And, you know, Japan, South Korea, even China, these are on the cutting edge of that. Um, so that, that creates a rationale for more immigration, but I think it's going to be immigration that is, is highly controlled. I, I can't imagine what would make governments now willing to accept large numbers of people who come without some kind of control, unless there's something truly extraordinary, like we saw something truly extraordinary with the reception of Ukrainian uh, refugees. And the reasons for that positive reception are overdetermined. They, they, were, they were coming from a country um, that was an ally of the country that was receiving them, let's say Poland. Um, accepting them was a way to shame the common enemy of, of Russia, 
Um, they were typically white, they were Christian, they spoke a Slavic language. All of those different reasons overlap and made a really strong rationale. Although we've also seen that the welcome has started to grow thin. And that usually happens also in refugee situations where those who are welcomed at first over time become much less welcomed. You've actually just answered my question as well, which was about Ukraine. But maybe I can um, augment that and ask if you can think of any other sort of bright spots in history, either for the U.S. or other countries in working with refugees and wondering about sort of Vietnam or other kind of ways where there was a receptivity that we don't always see concurrently. Yeah, yeah, great question. So, and you know, I don't, I don't want to say that any particular policy didn't have problems, but let's take the example you just brought up with Vietnam. So, you know, as, 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 as you know, because you just brought it up in, in the late 70s, but including in the, in the 80s, there were compacts between the government of Vietnam, so-called countries of first asylum, like the Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia, and the resettlement countries, US, Canada, Australia, France, Germany. Um, and they agreed that if that flow was orderly um, coming out of Vietnam, that people could go to first countries of asylum, say Indonesia, they would stay in the camp, but for a or even more, say, Thailand, they, they would stay in a camp for a particular period of time, but not indefinitely. And the resettlement countries agreed to take them. And that happened on the scale of many hundreds of thousands, um, including from a place like Canada, which had not been part of that war. And so it is an example of countries of origin, transit, destination, coming together, brokered uh, an agreement brokered by the UNHCR to reduce the massive loss of life that was happening uh, in the South China Sea as people were spontaneously leaving on boats to try to seek asylum elsewhere. So in that sense, that's a success story of international collaboration that we don't really see right now. There, there are deeper historical examples that have often been forgotten during the League of Nations period, for example, when uh, groups of countries got together and they agreed to allow free movement for work among refugees. Now, in those days, refugees were from particular nationalities. Um, so, so just to give most, the, the largest example, Russians who had fled the, the Russian Civil War. And you eventually had a group in the 30s of uh, 40 to 50 countries that said, OK, if you're, if you're a Russian refugee, you have one of these so-called Nancy passports, you can move around and work in these areas. So the Russians didn't all end up in the same country. They, they went to where there were opportunities, where they had family ties and sort of naturally sorted themselves out. There were policies right after World War II to find uh, work visas for refugees. Again, there's some, uh, th there's some conceptual problems with this, some moral problems with this. But on the other hand, these were visas that allowed people who would not be uh, resettled in a country like Belgium or Britain or France to go as, as refugee workers. Um, and so some people have said, well, it's interesting to look at that and think about another legal pathway, um, which might not be as good as being a resettled refugee, but evidently there's not an appetite in any country in the world to receive you know, much, much larger numbers of resettled refugees. So this could be a complementary pathway. Any further questions? I'm not really asking a question, but I would have only one more question. <laughs> <laughs> because this is my topic of work, so of course I have a million questions. What I meant before was that this is not the case with the U.S., but in the U, each and every country is in a democratic de de decline, demographic decline, I, um, where it's like 50% of the population are elderly people. So, of course, they cannot maintain. It is obvious, even by living there without studying anything, that they cannot maintain their social security system. So that's what I meant. I don't know if anyone has done this study of calculating how much it would cost to integrate these uh, asylum seekers or refugees um, and also I wanted to ask you because it is very hard for me to understand why asylum seekers are not given social rights once they enter the country do you have any explanation for that because it is as you said before if a country wants to use public health concerns not to allow people to get in once they get in why don't they give them public health for example you know access to health and education do you have an explanation for that Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, yeah, great question. So, you know, the, the kinds of benefits or rights that asylum seekers can access, but while they're 
they're, while they're asylum seekers, before they've been declared to be asylees, and then they get different rights. So while they're seeking asylum, um, those, those rights vary a lot across country and across time. The general story that we can tell is one of declining rights, declining access to benefits, and a lot of countries, the UK is a great example of policies that make it much, um, much less comfortable, much more difficult to even just survive with the basic necessities as an asylum seeker. And there's an obvious rationale for it, which is to try to deter people from, from coming and doing the same thing. So that the government is able to say, well, we're not refouling anyone. Uh, we're not returning them to the arms of the persecutors, but we're going to make it really hard for them so, there will, so the numbers will be small. And you know, one of the live political issues in the US is the fact that if you apply for asylum in the US, you have to wait for six months before you can work. Um, so imagine, and you're not eligible for any kind of you know, refugee resettlement benefits. The government has to, hasn't determined whether or not you meet this refugee standard in the first place. So how do you, how do you make a living? What would you do in Santa Clara if you, if you couldn't legally work for six months um, and there's not, there aren't resettlement benefits? Well, if you're lucky, you have family resources, there's an NGO, or probably you work under the table. So, you know, a lot of people have talked about the need to, to reduce that, that period of time. And there's important work done just up the road here by Jens Heinmuller and his colleagues at the Stanford Immigration Lab showing that in, uh, I think this was a study in Switzerland and Germany, if I recall correctly, that keeping asylum seekers out of the labor market during those, um, those periods for their processing, of, let's say it's like a year or two, uh, that that had terrible economic consequences for them in the long run, even after they got asylum and had full legal status. Um, just being out of the labor market for these long chunks of time is really bad for someone's um, economic prospects. And it means that's bad for their integration because it's bad for the host society. So the, 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 there are a lot of rationales that go beyond a humanitarian rationale to reduce that period, maybe to reduce the zero, I don't know, of, uh, of how long people have to wait until they can work. Well, then we'll go upstairs and continue it at the at the reception. But thanks, David. Uh, so it stayed with me. Uh, your verbiage of in the spirit of a more humane migration. Uh, are there current, in your opinion, countries, governments that at the very least aren't undermining that spirit, even if not necessarily, you know, some romanticized ideal way, but at the very least lead even at, at bare minimum, more of a neutral and undermining, which by the layperson's view, seems like most countries, it's kind of a, a sport in a way to who can undermine most in the, the most nuanced of ways. Yeah, so I, I, I wish that I could give you a, a positive response. Um, but the truth is that I think there's a, there's a race to the bottom on this issue. It's, it's hard to find a single country that I would hold up as an example, um, especially when we're talking about these remote control kinds of issues. So even countries that have done a good job relative to other peer countries like Canada, when it comes to refugee resettlement, they have the highest levels of refugee resettlement on a per capita basis. Um, you know, public benefits compared to other countries are more, more generous in many ways. But even in that, in that case, um, you know, Canada is taking a small fraction of the refugees per capita, per capita Canadian population, compared to a country like Jordan or Lebanon or Turkey. So, you know, refugee resettlement is this tiny fraction of, like I said, half a percent of the world's refugees. So, so when you think about the bigger picture, then all of a sudden Canada doesn't look so generous anymore. Um, and when it comes specifically to remote control, the Canadian government does all of the things that that I've just listed up here. It's able to do those things usually in a softer way because of two factors. One is geography. It has these enormous Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. And then it's got the U.S. as the world's largest buffer state. Um, if, if it weren't for that, I think that Canadian policy would look very much like you know, U.S. policy. There's no reason to think that it would be any different, to be honest. So that's, that's just kind of an accident that has nothing to do with the uh, the political character of that country, it's just geography. Thank you very much, David, and I appreciate you answering all these questions. And again, we have a reception upstairs. Um, I think a student will help us lead us there, and Mary will be here to lead us.